This video is brought to you by Manscaped.com, the global brand for men's grooming and hygiene products. If you're watching a Donnie Darko video essay, there's a good chance you could use it. A couple months ago, I made a video revisiting some staple film bro, film thought movies that were naturally some of my favorites in my formative years. But before I had seen most of the movies I talked about in that video, my older brother showed me Donnie Darko, which I figured was the only appropriate next step for this series. I didn't really understand it back then, but I liked it. I assumed this is most people's first experience with the film. I actually watched it again like a week later just because I thought I had missed something, but it was just as confusing, and I think I got as much out of it as I could have at that time. It didn't occupy as much active space in my mind over the last 10 plus years, but rewatching it for this video made me realize it's had a more subconscious, but no less severe influence on me. I think letting it gestate for so long really helped the dots connect this time around, but I've also gotten to appreciate Richard Kelly more, with Southland Tales and in the box revealing his isms, which I love. And they not only illuminate how singular Donnie Darko is on its own, but even within Kelly's filmography. He's a maximalist by nature, and I think upping the cosmic ante in his later films brought them into a realm of inaccessibility that Donnie Darko constantly teeters on, but clearly still managed to connect with a wide audience. I think in general this is because it has a smaller and consequently more mysterious sci-fi scope, but I also think it's doing something Kelly's subsequent films sort of pull apart and deconstruct. Southland Tales is a farcical satire, and The Box is a pretty straight-faced horror thriller. And even though these movies narratively and thematically go to broader places than Donnie Darko, they're mostly contained on a genre level that I think Darko balances perfectly. I've always thought of it as an anti-Halloween movie, Movie, a psychological drama and coming-of-age film masquerading as a horror movie, which made it all the more fitting this time around to realize that the events lead up to the day before Halloween and then reset before we actually get to it. In actuality, I'm sure this is because the movie wanted to follow the Bush Dukakis election and the dates of 1988 just worked out that Halloween was on a Monday, which wouldn't make as much sense for this massive house party. But I do think it's emblematic of what the film is doing, and even though I remembered a persistent horror vibe with the film, I just didn't have the capacity at age 12 or 13 to realize how many genre films Kelly's borrowing from and piecing together here. The bright, hazy suburbs we track through establish a sense of unsettling stasis akin to Carpenter's Halloween, applied even more dystopianly to the Reagan era, which is matched by Frank's stoic stance affecting Michael Myers and an even more explicit reference on the theater marquee. There's a psycho callback they go see the evil dead, and there's a shot zooming into an old photo revealing someone from the past in a way that suggests the existence of time travel, like The Shining. But these references don't stop at horror. This shot at the golf course I can only justify as a reference to this shot from The Graduate, employing the same sense of plastic adults talking down to an aimless kid. I found the 80s instructional vibe to compare with those of the 50s, albeit not explicitly, but drawing a connection between both ends of upper-class nuclear family suburbs in the Cold War era. The climax of the movie is like an evil mirror version of E.T., evoking a Spielbergian innocence amid all the bleakness, and Drew Barrymore's character seems to be going for a Robin Williams in Dead Poet Society thing, further indicting the oppressive and moralistic authority of the school. Her presence and the flipping of horror tropes on their heads also seems to be in conversation with Scream, but that one might be a stretch on my part. And all of this comes together in what is also inherently and inescapably a late 90s, early 2000s high school movie. So this concoction of genres of course makes Donnie Darko mathematically the edgiest movie in existence. Even its more sentimental references are still in service of that bleak nihilism. But the reason it all works, which I suspect is the same reason it connects with so many young audiences, is because it's so explicitly tackling teen angst. So many scenes are set up to give Donnie, and by extension Kelly, a soapbox to diagnose society's problems, which gives the film a sense of authorial immaturity. The whole conflict with the love-fear matrix seems to strawman the institution the film is criticizing, like Kelly made up someone to get mad at. But that's what angsty teenagers do. They make up scenarios that oblige them to act out their power fantasies. The whole sit next to the boy you find the cutest scene also seems like a fantasy Kelly's acting out on screen. Which makes you wonder, are these things deconstructive, or are they just fantasies Kelly got lucky enough to be able to produce? Art, of course, unwittingly reveals who the artist is as a person, which makes this a success successful work in conveying Kelly as an angsty young man, but because that headspace is so aligned with the film's direct subject, it really doesn't matter what's intentionally and unintentionally commenting on angst. 
It's all angst no matter what. Kelly's framework is certainly full of satirical jabs, certain lines from Donnie that convince you that the movie does view him as immature. You know, I love that movie, the way they shot it. It's so, um, like futuristic, you know? As well as moments interrogating the very act of expressing this psychology through art. I'm painting and stuff. But if anything, these things being unintentional would ironically make the film a more poignant expression of the juvenile spirit because then it's real. Like, really real. There's a lot of confounding factors and misleading bits in this movie that have been debated for 20 plus years now, but upon this rewatch, I found it to be a surprisingly linear story about suicide, the ultimate culmination of that angst and depression. I'm about to get pretty into it, so if you don't want to keep watching, feel free to click out now. But not before I tell you about today's sponsor. Manscaped offers the best tools and liquid formulations for men's grooming and hygiene. They hooked me up with a bunch of stuff from their all-in-one Perfect Package 4.0. Let's check it out. We've got the new Lawn Mower 4.0, equipped with advanced skin-safe technology which reduces nicks and cuts, it's waterproof, has an LED battery signal, and a travel lock that keeps it from going off in your bag. Just click it three times and boom, you're not in camp Kansas anymore. They've also got their Crop Preserver All Day Body Odor Protector, their disposable magic mat for shavings, and for a limited time, you get all this plus two free gifts, the Shed Travel Bag and the Manscaped Anti-Chafing Boxer Briefs. Go to manscaped.com today and get 20% off plus free international shipping plus two free gifts when you use the promo code TJW at checkout. Alright, well, back to my video about Donnie Darko and suicide. So Richard Kelly's whole thing, to use reductive terms, is the hero's journey, the monomyth. He wrote Donnie Darko before really learning the archetypes, but his fascination with the hero's journey, in his own words, is that it's, it's fascinating to discover that formula so then you can figure out a way to corrupt it. On the surface, this just sounds like general subversion, but in Donnie Darko, there's a sense of main character syndrome that reveals the hero's journey to literally corrupt Donnie. Gretchen says that I guess some people are just born with tragedy in their blood. Which is about her own misfortune, but this also applies to depression as something genetically passed on to people and guides the film's debate on agency versus subservience. Mental illness commandeering a certain notion of free will. Gretchen's also the one that tells him his name sounds like a superhero, which the whole structure of the hero's journey supports, and the connection to Jesus the film makes with the last temptation of Christ on the marquee. And Donnie's final sacrifice to save the world is not even metaphorical, but literal suicide, albeit by convoluted metaphysical means. The final scene, watching his family in the aftermath, plays out in the language of a suicide more so than some bizarre airline disaster, which reinforces that idea. We get a montage of the people in his life affected by his death, Gretchen doesn't die, Miss Pomeroy doesn't get fired, Sharita's crush doesn't get exposed, etc. A symptom of depressive thinking is the notion that you're a burden and everyone in your life would be better off without you, and that you're actually doing them a service by killing yourself. Which is what the idea of saving the world represents here, and how the hero's journey is corrupted as a form of suicidal thought. The film calls these physics questions to mind as a comment on existence itself, but I think every branch of the film's absurd manifestations are primarily contributing to expressing the headspace of a suicidal person. Again, whether this was Kelly's conscious intent or not. Having covered this subject on my channel now more times than I ever expected to, I do think this film is not only the most psychologically valid, but artistically fulfilled representation of it that I've covered by a mile, especially considering my last video was on Blonde, a film that monotonously hammers away the same three psychological points while insisting that the whole point is its psychological expressionism. Donnie Darko manages to convey a more nuanced understanding of it while providing enough thematic and visual ideas to convince people of any number of interpretations that have nothing to do with suicide, some even validating the notion of Donnie as a superhero. The conservative and evangelical foundation of the Reagan era, the loneliness of existence and theological pondering, even the mechanics of time travel itself are enough to send people down any of these rabbit holes in and of themselves, but they all culminate in different aspects of Donnie's psychology that lead to his death. I'm not going to say there's not a case to be made that the film romanticizes suicide, 
I mean, I definitely thought a lot of the shit in this movie was just cool as a kid. Donnie's so smart and sticks it to the man. I thought Gretchen was such a cool countercultural name. And Mad World was, of course, designed to be played on loop while ponderously staring out your window. But any serious reading of the text would yield that, even as a subjective expression of Donnie's headspace, the film shows that his death doesn't make things better for everyone. Obviously, his family is devastated, even if relieved to some extent. But more importantly, his death means that Jim Cunningham keeps his influence and keeps being a pedophile, his outing being a net good that Donnie's existence caused. One could maybe read into this as an assertion that your life is only valuable if you do some sort of good deed like this, rather than life itself being inherently valuable. But I think it just demonstrates the push and pull, the good and the bad damage that comes with every life. Life. Plus, I think the Sharita element does play into the inherent value your life brings to others, even if you don't know it. She spared the embarrassment of Donnie learning about her crush in the timeline where he dies, but it's also pretty devastating for someone you have a crush on to fucking die. Now these thoughts aren't exclusive to teenagers, but that's definitely the age where they first start cropping up and people start looking for answers. And even though I enjoy being able to point out specific influences and deconstruct why I think the film works, there is something to be said of the net product for someone generally unfamiliar with a lot of the things the movie's in conversation with, as most of us were when we first saw it. A sense of feeling seen, even if you don't quite understand the answers the movie's giving you. I think the very nature of these things being unknowable is where the film turns back around and opens up those separate threads to be looked into. I think the very nature of these things being unknowable is where the film turns back around and opens up those separate threads to be read into individually. And the metaphysical mystery evokes a Lovecraftian horror of the cosmos, deriving fear from its very unknowability and just justifying the horror framework. The worst thing I can say about this movie is just that it's too quick to try and explain itself. It does a pretty clear job visualizing how the spear time vector thing works, but of course we have all these scenes with the physics teacher explaining this stuff. The Halloween references are pretty palpable even without a big Halloween sign shown to us, and any questions about agency and free will conjured by the narrative itself are then explicitly asked in dialogue. This is even worse in the director's cut, with text cards explaining the time travel concepts and whatnot, but I do think for all the explicit explanations, the fact that it's still been such a popular head-scratcher for so long is pretty impressive. After this movie, Richard Kelly definitely got lost in the sauce. It is a delicious sauce, I love Southland Tales and The Box, but Donnie Darko is such a comprehensive manifesto on everything his other work covers, and in such an airtight, self-nourishing package, its ideas are just as absurd as anything in Southland Tales, but it balances this humor with a dread arguably stronger than anything in the films it's referencing. It almost feels like his more calculated work is messier in execution, and this very spontaneous, lightning-in-a-bottle script for him is tightly structured against his best efforts. Such even incorporation of its surprisingly many plot points, the slow-motion trampoline shots serving as a plotless omen for the end of the world sprinkled throughout like the electromagnetic pulses animals detect before a storm, and how the film constantly equates the end of the world with death itself. Even with its more heavy-handed qualities, I can't imagine making something this well-balanced at 25 years old. Almost none of this stuff is what I liked about the movie back in the day. I liked it just as a moody coming-of-age film that takes a creepy sci-fi angle toward the end. But there is a strange quality to seeing something you know every scene of taking on a new life upon rewatch. I'd liken it to a reanimated corpse, but this viewing was the most alive I've felt watching a movie in a long time for as depressing as my new revelations are about it. As Richard Kelly said in the box, though, there's more I can get into. I can talk about 9-11, I can compare and contrast this movie with American Beauty, I can theorize on what the fat guy means in the grand scheme of things, though I think he serves a similar purpose to the bear suit guy from The Shining. But for the scope of this video, I think I'm gonna have to wrap it up here. Let me know what you think I should cover next in this series. I'm not immune to the most passe of films. I mean, I believe the films in this canon only got the notoriety they have because they're able to generate endless discussion. But hey, just let me know. My links are in the description, as you well know by now. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.